So here we are on the last session of Reconstruction, the deep roots of early Christian theology, these momentous times to be talking about some important things. Uh, why do we do this? Because deconstruction is common. It's even necessary. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to it, but I really don't, I, I, I hope that people's faith isn't collapsing or that holes are, are opening up in the foundation or the ceiling or however you think about it such that you, you can't share space with other people. The, the, the point of construction is to share space, is to build a, a place where you can enter into community. I think early Christianity helps us discern a strong foundation. And so as we've been doing here, we, we've identified controversial issues commonly debated in the West or Western Christianity. We examine early Christian views on the issue. We identify if, where, and why Christians shifted on the issue. And we try to recover a framework for approaching these issues in today's context. So we have been through some big uh, Christian ethics topics, slavery and women leadership. We've uh, looked at deep theological and uh, uh, practical ministry questions like how is God good and does God have a dark side? What, what was the understanding of hell in the early church? We looked at scripture, uh, politics, sexual ethics, and finally we're coming back to the Christian understanding of the person. All right, so this is called the person, the face, and the climb up the mountain. Let me, um, I know, let me pause just a second. Okay, the person, the face, and the climb up the mountain, Gregory of Nyssa and the vision of ecstasy. So super fun. Um, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to tell you a story about the photographer and the monks. We're going to talk about the Christian vision of the person and discuss it. We're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into Gregory of Nyssa and his work, The Life of Moses, which is a fun story about mountain climbing, and discuss that. And then we'll talk about, well, some trends in Protestantism about the human being, and uh, you know what do we take away from this? So here, here's a story. This is a picture of Mount Athos. I, I think it was a rare moment where there was snow because, and it's rare because this is in Greece. You don't usually get snow, but the um, this is on a mountain where the weather patterns are different. This this is um, a photographer who who went to take pictures of Mount Athos, which is a collection of monasteries. And, and he writes this, we were walking for a long time in the desert of Athos towards the horrible Karulia, an isolated desert region on the southernmost shore of Mount Athos, occupied principally by ascetics. A monk was sitting in his front yard. As we walked by, he lifted his head and said, you're the greatest photographer of Athos and you've come to take my picture. It was the first time we had met. I wasn't holding anything to indicate that I was a photographer. Fascinating. What happened here, right? I mean, and, and I, I share this story because um, I, I am um, a be believer that the Holy Spirit continues to deposit prophetic gifts or supernatural insights into believers, into followers of Jesus. Uh, because it's an aspect of Jesus himself. I mean, we are, the whole point of the Holy Spirit is to, in some ways, to invest more and more of the life of Jesus into us. Um, but this comes from the Greek Orthodox tradition, or actually the, just the general Orthodox tradition, and not from the Protestant charismatic or Pentecostal tradition. So I, I just spotlight this story to say, hmm, there's some commonalities, I think, if, if you are part of the Protestant charismatic or Pentecostal traditions, you would recognize something going on here. And, and it relates to this question of what is the human person? What are we meant to be and do in God's vision? And so what's the, what is the Christian understanding of that? I wanna start off with this quote by Gregory of Nyssa, who we'll get to know much more. If one thinks that Christianity consists solely in doctrinal precision, the Christian mystery becomes a pious fable. In other words, it's not just learning stuff. And during this time, during this whole course, I mean, we've learned a lot, obviously. I care a lot about doctrinal precision. <laughs> and probably you do too, on some level. And 
And yet there is more to our growth and development than just knowing things or figuring out what, what's the right way to use language. So uh, we see this already in the New Testament. Here's one example. This is Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where he talks about a vision that he had. I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body, I, I don't know. Such a man was caught up to the, the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, <laughs> was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. And it becomes, I know, I know he's narrating this in the third person, it becomes clear later, he's talking about himself and his own experience. And, you know, this is kind of a one incident in a thread of experiences that people have. Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 and 10, Daniel, Acts 10, Simon Peter in Acts 10, and John in Revelation have these visions of God or from God. And it raises a question, is this normative? I mean, to what extent should we be having, or should at least we be open to the experience like this? <clears throat> the other thing that is very deeply tied in, which I'll, I'll spend most of my time talking about, is the human person is also called uh, to heal and, de and develop our desires. Like we are working out a partnership with God about something about ourselves. So the often the the mystical or the supernatural things are tied in to this so <clears throat> and then that the deeper thing is what is god doing in christ healing human nature and so even in the, for example the ministry of jesus in the gospels you see him healing people of diseases or uh casting out death and demons and things like that well for for jesus what he does outside of himself in other people is a reflection of what he's doing inside of himself to the human nature that he took on, right? You see him going from birth all the way to death and resurrection. He is healing human nature on the deepest possible level. And this is uh, Paul talking in Romans 7 about how how he came to diagnose <clears throat> and many other jewish people came to diagnose the problem in human nature and this is the famous i do things that i don't want to do and and then i i don't do things that i do want to do why is that um and uh he eventually says in verse 21 i find then the principle that evil is present in me the one who wants to do good wretched man that i am who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So what he finds is that there are actually two competing desires or sets of desires in him. There is the I myself, and then there is my flesh, right? And, and so, be careful when you read this, by the way, because some people read it as if to say, um, uh, in verse 18, for example, uh, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. And then they stop. It's as if they think Paul put a period after that comment. Nothing good dwells in me? Well, that's not what he says. He says, <clears throat> that is, in my flesh. And what he's calling the flesh is the, the corruption of sin in his human nature. And, and that's the name he gives for it. So he is clear that there is a part of him, actually the deepest part of him, the most fundamental part of him that is made in the image of God that still recognizes God. He calls that the I myself, right? Like he wants to love God, serve God, obey the law. That's the I myself. But then there's the flesh, which wants to do something else, wants to run away, rebel, whatever. So, so that's the, the human person in, in the, the Christian understanding, is that the line between good and evil kind of runs right down the middle of us, or you could say it in different ways, or that we, we are struggling, right, between different desires. Uh, and so what we find in the early Christians is that 
there's a desire to imitate Jesus and participate in what he has done for human nature in himself and then as he applies that in us. And there's this very uh, in, intense interest in some of the emotions of Jesus because they are recognizing that their responses to other people or to the world around them has to be conditioned by how Jesus related to other people or the world around him. And so what does it mean that in John 11, Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus and he was incensed and wept, right? Anger and grief, those emotions. What, how did Jesus experience them? What were they directed at? Uh, what, what does that mean for us in our experience of anger and grief? Do we allow ourselves to feel anger and grief? Some of us don't, right? Some of us think, no, I, those are unpleasant. I don't think, I, I'm supposed to be joyful, joyful, joyful all the time. I only sing worship songs that are about happiness and, and closure, right? So no, we, I, I don't get training in how to feel those things. But clearly Jesus did. And that's just one instance. And that if he is the truly human one, then he's saying something about how we ought to experience emotions in partnership with him. Another is desire. I have lusted to eat this Passover with you, says Jesus at his last supper. He uses the word lust. I mean, a lot of English translations blunt that. They say, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. That's fine. But just know that the word is lust. Like he has strongly desired uh, this experience. Why? What, why is Jesus, why was he so interested in this meal? Uh, why, was, why does he say he feels this for his disciples? We need to think about that. Or for the joy set before him. This is one place Jesus is said to feel joy. Another one is Luke 10, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And so the, the early Christians are looking at these things and saying, um, well, we want to be like Jesus because he is the truly human one. We are becoming more and more human. Athanasius of Alexandria wrote The Life of Anthony. We looked at that last week. And it, from a certain point of view, uh, with regards to sex and sexual ethics and temptation, but the, the larger point, I mean, that's not all that the life of Anthony is about. It's, it's about imitating Jesus in a particular way, and so Athanasius is actually uh, describes Anthony almost just like the, the Gospel of Matthew describes Jesus. The, the flow, the structure, literary patterns, um, it's really striking. The, there's another practical reason why the early Christians were interested in this, and I think that, and there's growing uh, scholarship on this, that they were recovering from trauma. We are coming to know trauma more and more in our day, uh, both its it impact on our body, our epigenetics, our emotions, our neural wiring, and, and so on. They had to contend with a lot of violence and sexual abuse especially in the Greco-Roman cities. So it's not a surprise to, to me, at least, that we uh, know of at least three uh, instances where Athanasius and Basil of Caesarea advise Christians about what to do when they feel same-sex pedophilia uh, attraction. And they do not think it's... Uh, Good, but they, they do not shame it either. They're very candid about talking about it. Um, they, they talk about it for communities, that, and this is the advice that they give is fascinating. But they, these are just some examples. Uh, uh, and I raise that because I think for most people, the, the reason why they feel a temptation towards pedophilia is because they were traumatized themselves. They were victims of sexual violence when they were children. It does something to our development, or, or it perhaps it opens a door that we think is appropriate. The early Christians are wrestling with all these things. Another um, thing that we see is in the early church are, uh, are these typologies about desire and development. So, so if any of you know the Enneagram 
or you like tools that are, are kind of like the Myers-Briggs, you know, temperament indicator and this kind of thing. Um, it, we find early Christians from like the fourth century, Evagrius of Ponticus, developing lists of types of sins um, or types of development. So that particular list kind of got morphed by John Cassian and Benedict uh, into the Roman Catholic seven deadly sins. So th that's where it comes from. And, and I think there is at least contact. I mean, um, we don't really know the origins of the Enneagram. I'm personally fascinated with it, but I, I think you can see uh, kind of precursors in the early church to, to this tool. And it's very useful for spiritual direction today and, and a sense of human development. So <clears throat> this is a quote from Peter Brown, who's one of the greatest uh, historians of the early church. He says this, the desert became the powerhouse of a new culture. The discipline of meditation on the holy text often assumed philological resources or training that could be found only in upper class circles in close proximity to great cities. In the life of Anthony and in successive layers of monastic spiritual guidance, we can detect the emergence of an alternative. The monk's own heart was the new book. What required infinitely skilled exegesis and long spiritual experience were the movements of the heart and the strategies and snares that the devil lay within it. But the deepest relief of the soul came now not from the written pages, but from that tap of the old man's fingers upon the disciple's chest, which assuaged the heart beneath. The shift from a culture of the book to a cultura day, based largely on the non-literate verbal interchange of a monastic art of thought, was rightly hailed as the greatest and the most peculiar achievement of the old men of Egypt. It amounted to nothing less than the discovery of a new alphabet of the heart. What a beautiful statement, and it's very well put. And uh, here's a map that shows in using the purple icon, uh, what we know about monasteries um, to the extent that they were physical buildings uh, or convents to the extent that those were physical buildings and where they were. So you could see that they kind of clustered around <clears throat> the, um, the, the main cities, except in the, the West where in Gaul and Ireland and, and Britain, you, you do have a lot of monasteries and that's, that's a fascinating story, uh, very significant in the history of European uh, Christianity. But in any case, I, I wanted to read a, a few quotes about how these early Christians thought about the person and our growth and development. This is what it meant to be human. So this is Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century. Man or human beings, a created and organized being is rendered after the image and likeness of the uncreated God. The father planning everything well and giving his commands. The son carrying these into execution and performing the work of creating and the spirit nourishing and increasing what is made. But man making progress day by day and ascending towards the perfect, that is approximating to the uncreated one for the uncreated is perfect, that is God. The idea here is we are finite, limited, created beings that are getting to know the infinite being of love. And that means infinite growth for us. That, that just makes sense. We are not static, in other words. Like God made us to grow. It is actually the only way that he could make us. Okay, here's another. This is John Cassian, who is a monk, uh, took the monastery model into Palestine. And, and he writes in his book, The Conferences, and he says this, it cannot then be doubted that there are by nature some seeds of goodness in every soul implanted by the kindness of the creator. But unless these are quickened by the assistance of God, they will not be able to attain to an increase of perfection. And therefore, the will always remains free in man and can either neglect or delight in the grace of God. For the apostle would not have commanded saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, had he not known that it could be advanced or neglected by us. That's Paul in Philippians 2 verse 13. 
And, and of course he knew that, but that men might not fancy that they had no need of divine aid for the work of salvation, he subjoins, for it is God that works in you both to will and to do, or to desire and to do of his good pleasure. And therefore he warns Timothy and says, neglect not the grace of God which is in thee, and again, for which cause I exhort thee to stir up the grace of God which is in thee. I think that's Second Timothy. So, <clears throat> uh, he, he, this is going a little further and saying, well, how does God draw us into a deeper relationship with himself, into higher uh, and, and higher levels of our development? And, and the answer is, it's because he puts stuff in us that draws us to him. Like there are by nature some seeds of goodness. It's, it's part of being made in the image of God. And so he, uh, we have a choice about what we do with those desires. That's true. But our desire for beauty, our desire for love and connection, our desire for justice, our desire for goodness, like that comes from God. It is God maintaining a foothold or a, a finger touch on us, in us, in our conscience. Paul talked about that in Romans 2. And, and here's another, uh, centuries later, John of Damascus giving kind of the summary of patristic thought that came before him. He says this, bear in mind too, that virtue is a gift from God implanted in our nature and that he himself is the source and cause of all good. And without his cooperation and help, we cannot will or do any good thing. Notice the similarity of phrasing, Philipp that's Philippians 2.13, right? To will and to do any good thing, but we have it in our power either to abide in virtue and follow God who calls us into the ways of virtue or to stray from paths of virtue, which is to dwell in wickedness and to follow the devil who summons but cannot compel us. For wickedness is nothing else than the withdrawal of goodness or perhaps withdrawal from goodness, just as darkness is nothing else than the withdrawal of light. While then we abide in the natural state, we abide in virtue. But when we deviate from the natural state, that is from virtue, we come into an unnatural state and dwell in wickedness. That phrasing, natural or what is by nature, is really important. For the early Christians, it, uh, it is really important to say what we are by nature, because if our nature was created flawed that, or evil, then God must be the cause of that. But, it, but they are really at pains to say, no, it's not. That is, there, there is, our nature is good, our original uncorrupted nature, and it remains in us, although there is a problem. And so you, many of you are probably familiar with the NIV translation of uh, the word, the Greek word sarx, which is flesh. They call it sin nature. The early Christians would say, you can't speak that way. Sin does not have a nature. Sin is a corruption, it's a disorder and a perversion. And so it, it does not have a nature, or we, we shouldn't say it is natural at all. It is unnatural. Does that make sense? I hope so. We can talk about it later. And then here's a modern- I'm sorry to interrupt, but time check. Probably a couple more minutes for this section. Great, thank you. Uh, here is Sarah Coakley. She's an Anglican theologian, and she wrote a book called God, Sexuality, and Self. She has this wonderful quote, and, and she makes it kind of hit home. Fro uh, this is about how we develop our desires. Take those desires that God gave and develop them further. Freud must be, as it were, turned on his head. It is not that physical sex is basic and God ephemeral. Rather, it is God who is basic, and desire the precious clue that ever tugs at the heart, reminding the human soul, however dimly, of its created source. Hence, desire is more fundamental than sex. It is more fundamental, ultimately, because desire is an ontological category belonging primarily to God and only secondarily to humans as a token of their createdness in the image. But in God, desire, of course, signifies no lack as it manifestly does in humans, right? The, the reason why we desire one another, desire friendship, desire this and that, is because we lack things, <laughs> rather, but that's not true for God. So we, we can't carry that connotation in. It's not that God lacks anything. 
Rather, it connotes that plenitude of longing love that God has for God's own creation and for its full ecstatic participation in the divine Trinitarian life. In other words, he feels it for our sake. God longs for us because he longs for us to be every, and become what he made us. This is um, helpful because, well, uh, this is what CS, how C.S. Lewis reflects on this because he's aware of all this stuff. He says, uh, this is why we need to keep growing infinitely. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. You can understand the nature of drunkenness when you're sober, not when you are drunk. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. That is fascinating. That, that has so many implications, but it's a fun thing to think about. So uh, the early Christians thought about wanting to see God. Jesus had said, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. How do we see God? How, th that's the you know, motifs of transfiguration or Moses' face being lit with glory, Jesus' entire body being lit up with glory, really important to them. How do we see these kinds of things? And how do we express the experience of God? So at some point, you know, we run out of words to speak. Paul even said this in 2 Corinthians 12, inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak like. What? What are you talking about? What words are inexpressible? And why can't we go further? Well, that's because words can only take us so far. Words become a signpost to experience. So here's, here's a, a helpful parallel. Describe chocolate for me without using the word chocolate. Can you do it? I don't think so. Describe cinnamon for me without using the word cinnamon. Or, or look, I'll, I'll even let you do it. How do you describe it? I don't know. Do you, do you use the word silvery? Do you use the word rich? Do you, I mean, d does that narrow it down? No, that's, well, maybe it does, but it doesn't get you far enough. Ultimately, the words chocolate and cinnamon are signposts. They're pointers to an experience. Either I have had the same experience of chocolate and cinnamon as you have, and therefore we can use these words to point to something that is beyond the word itself, or it's just an invitation to a deeper experience. Does that make sense? This is not a cop-out, in other words. When Christians say things like uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I don't know exactly how to push, how to define those things, define those labels more, I just have to stop there. Well, that's not a cop-out or it's not us being anti-intellectual. It just is. And it's just the function of how language works and many other words operate that way. Beauty, goodness, love, connection, they, they deepen as we experience them. They, they deepen for us. It's not that the words themselves become irrelevant. They actually become more relevant, but we can't use more words to describe what we're after. We can only enter into worship. We can only enter into experience. And that's how the early Christians thought of theology. Cataphatic and apophatic means uh, God is and God is not. There is theology that says God is love, and then there's negative theology, which says God is not narcissistic, for example. To, just to distinguish that, that may be a question that we have. And so we need an imagination for why, when, and why we participate in embodied practices like baptism, Eucharist, the worship service, and mission. All things that Jesus said, I'm present when you do these things. Why is that? How do we perceive him? What is our imagination? What are we seeing uh, when we do these things? And so let's discuss for a few minutes. I think we're, I would like to keep us, well, I, I'll go ahead and, Bayota, if you could set us up for breakout rooms. Sure. Um, here are some questions. How do Jesus' desires give shape, grounding, and limits to our desires? Number two, how do your Desire for beauty, goodness, love, belonging, justice, and all these good things, right? How do good desires reflect your desire for Jesus? How does your desire to sin reflect your desire for Jesus? And I'll just share one quick story. There was a young man who approached me once when I was doing college ministry, and we had a very rich conversation, and he said that he was struggling with um, viewing pornography. So not an unusual thing, um, but I was learning more about 
these things and reflecting on them. And my response, I think, was more helpful than the things that I had said before. <laughs> so what I said was, well, look, I mean, there may be some practical things about like um, uh, uh, accountability software and, and that kind of stuff. But I, I think when you feel the temptation to watch pornography, ask yourself this, slow down and ask yourself, what do you really want? What do you really want? Because I'm willing to bet that what you really want is uh, someone to care about you. You want intimacy. You, you want beauty. And if you name those things, then you can see how God is actually reaching out to you through these desires. Now, you need to not take the desires in a corrupted way. And sometimes our desires get uh, we mistake our desire for these good things with our desire for superficial things or, or even twisted and evil things. But you, you need to see that your desire to sin actually reflects your desire for Jesus. That's what I mean. I'll come back on the other side and tell you more about that experience. I'll give you 15 minutes. Okay, in the, in the next portion of this, I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into this work called Life of Moses by Gregory of Nyssa. So I told you we'd get to know him a little bit. Who is this guy? And what did he say about human being, human becoming? So uh, we've met him before. He had the strongest kind of abolitionist quote. So in session one, when we talked about slavery, that was this guy. Uh, he's the younger brother of Basil of Caesarea and Macrina the Younger, who was a um, philosopher and leader of a monastery, or I think a, a woman's, um, women's, single women's Christian organization that was in Cappadocia. He became Bishop of Nyssa twice. He was one of the three Cappadocian fathers uh, who had a major role in kind of the, the generation after Athanasius. And he, he's often called the father of mysticism because of this writing. Um, you could find this book as a classic of Western spirituality. It, it, although, like, I find that hardly anyone in the West knows it. So, um, it, it, I had you read a little bit of it, or at, uh, I, I sent you a PDF of it. And if you read it, you might be kind of puzzled, like, this is weird reading this. And it's because he's not doing exegesis as we would understand exegesis, right? What he's doing is he's doing this creative re retelling or redeployment of the story of Moses going up the mountain, including from, you know, the Moses going to Pharaoh, confronting Pharaoh, and then leading Israel and going up the mountain. And so a, a lot of people actually um, used that story. There was a Philo of Alexandria. He was a, a Jew who was Hellenistic. Yeah, and he used the story in a certain way. Uh, and then in the Christian community, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, uh, who, who Gregory of Nyssa really liked, these guys. Uh, Augustine of Hippo uses it. So in the Latin West, uh, we have a representative. There's Dionysius or pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite, who is a big deal to the Orthodox. And then there's this anonymous book called The Cloud of Unknowing, which actually refers to the cloud in which God appeared or descended on Mount Sinai. And the idea is like, as you get to know God, you, you have to unknow or unlearn a few other things. So needless to say, it's a, it's a common uh, story to reflect on. And I mean, this is one representation of what that, what Israel might have faced um, when, when they met God on Mount Sinai. I doubt that Mount Sinai was th that tall, <laughs> but anyway, the, the important thing here is that <clears throat> climbing mountains um, is a biblical theme, and it was a motif of how we meet with God or uh, making pilgrimages to meet with God. And if any of you like hiking or mountain climbing, you know that you, you have to build up your muscles to do it. And, and I actually do think that that's part of the reason why it's in scripture, because the more you do it, the easier it gets. Does that make sense? Like it, and so physical fitness is like spiritual fitness, and we'll have a chance to talk about that. But 
uh, you, you might ask, well, where is that in scripture? Well, Eden is a mountain, Ezekiel said so, and Genesis 2.10 describes four rivers coming off of Eden or out from Eden. The only way rivers diverge in nature is if you're going from higher elevation to lower, because otherwise rivers converge in nature. They, they find the lowest point. So this must be a high point. Um, and Ararat is the next mountain. The Ark of Noah settles on Ararat and life spreads out from there, just like life spread out from Eden after the spirit hovered over the waters and called forth land and all this stuff, right? Noah and his family are a new humanity, a version 2.0, I guess. Uh, and then God calls Abram and Abram settles uh, or builds this altar on a mountain between Bethel and Ai. Uh, it's a marker of his life. And then the sacrifice of Isaac is on Mount Moriah. And then of course you have Sinai and Zion. And <clears throat> uh, the Psalms have this little section called the Songs of Ascent or Pilgrimage, Psalm 120 to 134, which the Jews would have sang as they came up from the low valley up the, the slopes of Mount Zion to worship God at the temple. And then you have <clears throat> Jesus on mountains. Now, it's not exactly the, sa it, it, the same idea um, because Jesus plays with the motif of mountains. I mean, he's deliberately mischievous. So on Mount Tabor, for, for instance, uh, when he's transfigured, he says, you could move after that, he says, you could move this mountain if you have faith. And he's not saying that mountains are obstacles that like, if you have faith, God will resolve the problem by moving it out of your way, right? That's prosperity theology. That makes no sense. And that sets off uh, uh, bad expectations for God. Mountains to a Jewish audience meant the presence of God. Jesus had just went up on a mountain, showed the presence of God in a cloud, and, and was saying, you could take this experience and put it anywhere. You can bring God's presence with you wherever you go. And then on Mount Zion, there's the antithesis, the temple where God was supposed to be. And Jesus there says, you could take that mountain and throw it into the sea. <laughs> and I, I think there's maybe a double meaning there. He means uh, just relegate it to the realm of the Roman Empire. Uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, he plays with that again, and he, in his resurrection, meets the disciples on a mountain in or around the Sea of Galilee, or right next to it, and so it's a mountain in the Sea of the Gentiles, and he says, I'm with you. Let's go on a mission, and that we call that the Great Commission. Uh, there's also, maybe he's, he, he's, that's the same mountain that Satan took him up to in the temptation, he says, look at all the nations, and Jesus says, no, um, but then later he says, now they're mine, right? It's possibly the same mountain, and then there's a mountain where he does one of the miracles. So the, um, that, that is the biblical theme of mountains, and, and that's part of what's in the background for us. Now, Gregory of Nyssa says that as a theme verse, he uses Philippians 3, 13, and 14. Philippians, as we've seen, like played a big role in the early church. Uh, reaching forward towards what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. That word, epektinomos, uh, means to stretch out of oneself or to be drawn out of oneself, and it becomes the English word ecstasy or ecstasis means to strain out of oneself. And as you recall, Athanasius made that one of the themes of Life of Anthony in chapter seven. Why is that? Because this is a workout. It's a workout to learn how to meet with God. But the more you do it, the more you like it, right? It's, it's like eating healthy or uh, taking up a new sport, learning how to run a half marathon. Like the, the more you train, the more your body actually desires this. And, and this is, uh, in that way, it's the flip side of fasting, right? Fasting is challenging your body uh, with deprivation. Uh, climbing a mountain is challenging your body by adding something. It's developing muscle. So they are complementary. I'm, I'm not saying 
Uh, I'm not saying don't fast, but I, but you know, we, we neglect this motif a lot, the climbing of a mountain. So anyway, uh, do, 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 do. Gregory of Nyssa's paradigm is to grow towards perfection, towards a proper maturity and uh, in relation to virtue. Virtue is what comes by second nature, right? It's the character qualities really of Jesus, but it's, it's what we develop in ourselves so that we, we want more and we do more of God and, and of God's will. That is one limit of perfection for us is the fact that it has no limit. That's what Gregory thinks uh, about human growth. There, there is actually no limit, although it probably becomes like an asymptote, it kind of levels off. But, uh, but anyway, we, we keep growing infinitely. So the, the first thing he does is say, Jesus frees us to ascend. So for our sake, he became a serpent that he might devour and consume the Egyptian serpents produced by the sorcerers. So again, he's playing with the story of from, you know, Moses's life from Exodus to Sinai. And, um, and basically, this is medical substitutionary atonement, right? It is not a penal substitutionary atonement. Jesus doesn't take the penalty. He becomes one of us so that he can acquire the the problem we have and fight against it for us. And he says, for instance, that the Lord was made into sin for our sake. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. That's a shorthand for made into sinful humanity for our sake by being invested with our sinful nature. That's not the best translation, but anyway. For our sake, he became a serpent that he might devour and consume the Egyptian serpents produced by the sorcerers. So uh, let, let me read. Well, anyway, you get the idea of what he's doing there. So uh, Jesus is victorious for us as one of us, uh, a fallen human being, or bearing a fallen human nature. Uh, because man finds himself between these two who have contrary purposes for him, it is in his power to make the one prevail over the other. Now he's describing our struggle to become. And, and get this, he uses the motif of literally a good angel and a bad angel. While the good angel, by rational demonstration, shows the benefits of virtue, which are seen in hope by those who live aright, his opponent shows the material pleasures in which there is no hope of future benefits, but which are present, visible, can be partaken of, and enslave the senses of those who do not exercise their intellect, or their imagination is a better translation here. Exercise their imagination. And what is he doing with the story? He is reading it with imagination. So what's he saying here? Uh, well, you know, uh, I'll just personalize it. I could, I get really excited about chocolate, but once I eat it, there's none left. But when I'm excited about Jesus, uh, there is more to come, right? That, I mean, that, that's part of what he's saying here, the difference between hope and uh, versus no hope of future benefits. So that's one way he describes it. Uh, another way he describes human becoming is if then one should withdraw from those who seduce him to evil and by the use of his reason turn to the better, putting evil behind him, it is as if he places his own soul like a mirror face to face with the hope of good things. Mark that he says face and how he uses face to face because that's a major motif of Moses coming face to face with God, sort of his face shining, and uh, how that carries over later. Face to face with the hope of good things, with the result that the images and impressions of virtue, as it is shown to him by God, are imprinted on the purity of his soul, right? That's virtue ethics, that we make choices that then have this impact on us. We're not scoring points on some score sheet in God's mind. If if you want to think of a score sheet, then just think of your own, your own self. We make imprints on ourselves. Then his brother brings him assistance and joins him for the angel who, in a way, is a brother to the rational and intellectual and imaginative part of man's soul appears, as I've said, and stands by us whenever we approach the Pharaoh, the enemy. So uh, then Gregory explains what it's like to break free of the enemy and move in the direction that God is 
calling us to go. He says, our destination is desire. So the, there's these phrases, for instance, he says, activity directed towards virtue causes its capacity to grow through exertion. And again, that is true. That is true in a physical sense. That is true in a spiritual sense. He says, what Moses yearned for is satisfied by the very things which leave his desire unsatisfied. Isn't that a clever way to put it? I think that's a beautiful, elegant, and imaginative way to, to put it. He, he is saying the reason why, ultimately, the, um, in eternity, why the redeemed don't sin anymore is because our desires are then fully fixed on God and on Christ, and our desires for him are unsatisfied, but somehow also satisfied by being unsatisfied. So he says, the reward for desiring God is more desire for God. Every desire for the good constantly expands as one presses on towards the good. This is the vision of God. To see God is to never be satisfied by the desire to see him. So clever. And, and what it means to see God is to move in the same direction as God's expansion. So uh, uh, he says, to follow God wherever he might lead us is to behold God. He makes a big deal. Uh, so here, uh, what he's doing, two things simultaneously. He's saying, um, as, we, as we get closer to God, like we, we desire him more. And um, C.S. Lewis uses this as a motif in his last book. Uh, the Last Battle, where he's describing uh, how they leave Narnia into the greater Narnia, which, which is the kind of the resurrection, the world of eternity and resurrection. They found themselves walking together in a great bright procession it was up towards mountains higher than you could see in this world, even if they were there to be seen. But there was no snow on these mountains. There were forests and green slopes and sweet orchards and flashing waterfalls, one above the other, going up forever. And the land they were walking on grew narrower all the time with a deep valley on each side. And across that valley, the land which was the real England and Narnia grew nearer and nearer. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, as land the lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. Inexpressible words. And for this is the end of all the stories. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventure in Narnia had only been the cover and title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on, our, on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. So cool. The, the other thing that Gregory does is he, he, he tries to explain or imagine what it means to see God. And, and there is real seeing of God, but he's also fighting this um, heretical view, which they're the, called the eunomians, and, and they thought they could see the totality of who God is. And Gregory says, no. Um, we only apprehend. There's a difference between comprehending who God is and apprehending who God is, if that makes sense. We apprehend infinity. We don't comprehend infinity because to comprehend infinity would mean that our mind can somehow sense what's in the back of infinity. We don't, we never do that. We don't reach around that which is infinite and we can only apprehend it. We know that it's there. We know what to name it. We, know, we maybe know how to experience it or introduce someone to the experience of it, but we don't comprehend it. We don't fully, totally, exhaustively know it. That's not possible for us. Uh, and the way he says that is we, we, um, he, we can't look God in the face. We can only look at where God is facing and face in the same way. For he who moves to one side or brings himself to face his guide assumes another direction for himself than the one his guide shows him. Therefore, he says to the one who's led, 
my face is not to be seen. That is in Exodus, right? God says that to Moses. You, you can't see my face and live. So there's some way in which that's true, and that is do not face your God. How does Gregory explain that? If he does so, his course will certainly be in the opposite direction, for good does not look good in the face, but follows it. What is perceived to be its opposite is face to face with the good, for what looks virtue in the face is evil. He's saying, what direction are you facing? What, where's your face going? But virtue is not perceived in contrast to virtue. Therefore, Moses does not look God in the face, but looks at his back. For whoever looks at him face to face shall not live, as the divine voice testifies. Man cannot see the face of the Lord and live. That is clever. Uh, again, this is not eg exegesis, right? Like, this is just a creative use of the story. I and mean, what are you saying? You don't want to face the opposite direction that God is facing. That's why we, we say Moses didn't see God's, like, face to face in the head on collision sense because Moses aligned himself with God and faced the same way. So then he says a few more things. I won't um, uh, labor this, but he, he goes into Numbers 21, uh, where there are serpents and Jesus becomes like the bronze serpent in order to free us from the venom. And he does this to explain why it is that we still struggle. There's this flesh versus spirit struggle in us. Uh, the lust of the flesh against spirit has not completely ceased to exist. In fact, the gnawings of desire are fre frequently active even in the faithful. Nevertheless, the one who looks to the one lifted up on the wood rejects passion uh, or the passions, which are the, the, the disordered desires, diluting the poison with the fear of the commandment as with the medicine. The voice of the Lord teaches clearly that the serpent lifted up in the desert is a symbol of the mystery of the cross, when he says the son of man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. So what happens when we look at Jesus on the cross? We see him um, overcoming all the temptations in a final, ultimate, climactic sense. Right? He's not calling down angels. Uh, he's not giving into anger. He's not giving into whatever uh, other temptations he might be going through at that very moment to hate or what, whatever, or to be despairing. And, and so if that's where we're looking, then we are facing in the same direction as Jesus. And of course, that helps us be victorious over those same things in us. When we see that that's what he's doing, then it, it helps us walk in his victory. It's a victory over the sin in his humanity. So the, the, uh, this is a great example, stepping back now, of the developmental view of a relational self. So what does it mean? Uh, what does Gregory of Nyssa mean? What did the early Christians mean when we talk about the person and the human person? It means that we have a godly core self in relation with others. So we saw this in Romans 7. There is an I myself and there is sin which indwells me. But Paul says there's a difference and one is original and the other is the disease. God is present in the I myself the, the sin which indwells me is the twisted thing. That is not the true me. And what Jesus does is he joins himself with the true me and gives me more power. So the, the, the way Paul experiences desire is really important because he says the good that I want, that's very key versus the evil I don't want. He measures that against scripture. Uh, he talks about Jewish wisdom in Proverbs 8 because, uh, or, or this is another example of things that are quoted often in the early church because God's creation is made to fit with God's commands. Uh, God's commands are developmental for us. It's like eat right, exercise. You know, it's, it's wisdom is for our growth and development. <clears throat> and this is important because the by contrast, what we find it in certain areas of the Protestant Reformation where that took hold uh, was a very negative view of the self and our human desires. For example, Marx, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud all said or came very close to saying that we are predetermined by money, power, and sex, right? It's just the context of these things determine how we live and what we want and how we relate to other people. We're almost 
predetermined by these things. I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about why those philosophers really uh, could have only developed in the wake of the Protestant Reformation and not within the context of early Christianity or Eastern Christianity. Um, what do I mean here? I'll, I'll just skip over those two points. The imitatio Christi and participatio Christi basically means that we are called to imitate Christ to strengthen our truest desires and participate in Christ because he is our medical substitute. He's the source of our healing. So there's scriptures that relate to true desires and false desires, right? The false ones, Romans 1, Ephesians 4, are probably some well-known ones. <clears throat> and the positive ones would be Romans 6, 8, 12, Ephesians 4, the flip side of that uh, passage, and Philippians 2, verse 13. So th there, are, there are lots of scripture that talk about how we shape our own desires through our choices. Uh, we are called Godward, which it, it, the language for that in the New Testament is upward and outward, or things like that, because well, because there are no longer physical mountains that we're connected to, right? I mean, we're, we're not the Old Testament believers and the people, we're not the people of Israel in that sense. We don't have those geographic landmarks, but our, our choices are called, we're called upward and our desires are called upward or Godward. Um, participatio Christi simply means that if Jesus conquered the corruption of sin in human nature, then how else are we going to do it except by connection with him? And, and so this connects moral exemplar and substitutionary atonement. Jesus is really our moral exemplar, and he is our substitute, not in the sense of God really wanted some people to suffer, so Jesus suffered instead, but God really wanted our partnership, and Israel's partnership especially, in the healing of our own human nature, circumcise your heart, or cut something away from you. But they couldn't. And so Jesus substituted his faithfulness and obedience in for theirs and became the source of salvation from all the things that damage our humanity. Does that make sense? So there's that. All right. So I'd like to discuss these things. Um, I, and I'll, we're a small group, so I'll, I'll keep us all together. What do you think about Gregory's presentation about human being and human becoming? What do you think about the role of the face? And I'll have more to say about that, but I'd like to hear your thoughts so far. And how is physical fitness a helpful analogy for spiritual fitness? I realize there are limits to the analogy, so I'm not trying to go overboard on that. But the um, but I, I'm using it as a contrast to, let's say, fasting, right? Like a cre there's a creative tension there. And how is climbing mountains a helpful analogy for experiencing God? Okay, so last portion, Protestantism and the human being. What, why is it that some of, for some of us, we have not really uh, heard a lot of teaching on these things or had a human being, human becoming understanding or framework or a developmental human framework? It, um, I'll, I'll try to explain that. I think it's the influence of Augustine. As Luther, Calvin, and in some ways Arminius um, read Augustine and appropriated certain things from us, we developed a, a, a view that God's grace was competitive with human willing and virtue. And so this is Gerhard Ford writing, giving a Lutheran view. Um, I, I don't know that, I mean, I wish Grant were here. I don't know that this was, what every Lutheran would say, but he says this, in the contemplative mode, one strives towards perfection until theoretically, one would need less and less grace or perhaps finally no grace at all. Really? Is that how grace works? Like, it, so in, a, in, a, in essence, he's saying God's grace is mercy, but is that true? Is that definition true? Could God's grace be empowering grace? I think we find plenty of scripture to support that. But 
this is why there, there's some suspicion about the contemplative mode. And it really, you know, in, in some cases comes back to um, Luther and, and others who were monks during the medieval Catholic time, uh, turning away from that and saying that being a monastic uh, it ha has, they're very critical of their past lives. And so, you know, there's some of that. But really, the influence of Augustine comes from this book uh, on double predestination and what he said about human sinfulness. So near the end of his life, on he writes this book called On Predestination of the Saints, and he's basically saying we, we might desire God sometimes, but not enough to actually empower us to choose God. God has to actually reach down and change us. And, and so he does that for some. He predestines some to salvation in that sense and some to damnation by not doing it for others. So this is where the idea of double predestination creeps in. It has a long history. Uh, different church councils condemned it. Um, he, the church really wrestled with it. And eventually, like Prosper of Aquitaine tried to create a gentler version of Augustine. And, and then the Catholic Church said, well, we'll just accept Augustine and, and say he didn't mean it that way. Uh, we'll, we'll wait his earlier writings more than his later ones. And if you want a good collection of quotes and comments, there's this document that I keep on my website um, with just to show that everyone before Augustine uh, believed in, in human free will being perfected. And, and so predestination was not the way uh, or the double predestination was not the way Augustine understood it. Uh, what that meant for human desires, as as the Protestant world imbibed this this stuff that Augustine said, was human desires gives us no meaningful information, right? Because if if we if we really uh, have to proclaim the gospel and then have someone become a Christian and then um, let, let's say take their emotions seriously, because non Christians their emotions don't tell us anything uh, uh, important, then this is why, well, that, 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 there's a lot of problems associated with that. <coughs> Another way of understanding it is that Protestants, because of the um, <clears throat> belief that God's justice is meritocratic retributive rather than restorative, uh, interpreted human beings as desiring self-justification or we want to deserve things. So that's where our, our framework of, uh, of human life shifted from desiring to deserving. Like it's, it wasn't, what are we desiring and how do we shape our desires so that we desire Jesus more? It's, do we think we deserve something from Jesus? Like th there's a transactional rather than a participatory emphasis. And so the shift from desire to deserving uh, became really, really pronounced. And the practical outcomes is that we're really bad at listening. <laughs> How many of us, like, you know, we're, we're told you need to go out in the park and share the gospel with people. And what that meant was like telling them something. You don't have to really listen to them or get to know them or hear their story. You just need to tell them something about what Jesus' death means. And then based on how they respond, that's it. So, so then there's this suspicion also of one's neighbor, because look, if, uh, if they're so sinful that they're never really going to choose God until they actually do choose Jesus, then you fear their sinfulness. And I think that has a lot to do with Christian nationalism and kind of the fear of one's neighbor today. And then there's a suspicion of oneself, because as soon as you ask yourself some serious questions like, well, how do I know I'm saved or things like that, then <clears throat> um, that could be a real downward spiral as well. So <clears throat> there, fortunately, I think there's a lot of signs that we're returning to the early Christian vision of being and becoming. How do I see that in both secular and pastoral contexts? So so the secular ones would be therapy, psychology, neuroscience. Neuroscience especially is really interesting because it's, it's undeniable that if I make choices to uh, 
stimulate the pleasure center in my brain by, I don't know, smoking lots of crack or watching pornography or playing excessive video games, then those choices become more attractive tomorrow. But if I instead invest deeply in relationship uh, or, or gratifying things uh, that are real, music, learning a language, like those are things that stimulate the brain in that direction, which are quite healthy. Uh, child development and social work also have actually actual roots in Christian faith um, that were really important. Pastorally, we're seeing um, uh, kind of a rediscovery of liturgy in the church calendar. I put John Wesley and Methodism here because that is one trajectory I, uh, that uh, of um, the Protestant world, which kind of drew from the Anglicans and never which was never dominated by Calvin. And John Wesley in particular actually really liked Gregory of Nyssa and Macarius of Egypt. And, and, and so his heart strangely warmed, he, like his reflection on experience, like emotional and bodily experience is, is kind of a stamp on that whole tradition. And that became common in, um, any, the, like the Pentecostal or the holiness movements, like there, there's some kind of second blessing after conversion. I mean, that's how they thought about it um, but and how they expressed it. But the, the essence of it was <clears throat> a growth paradigm, right? A human be becoming paradigm. Uh, we are in the Protestant world becoming re-interested in spiritual disciplines and a rule of life or rhythm of life. Rule of life simply means a, a measure, like a, 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 can, a measuring stick uh, by which you, you look at your life. Um, it's a little unfriendly uh, as a word today. And so I use rhythm of life, but essentially think of it as what's your workout regimen? What's your workout routine and habit, right? Like spiritually speaking. And uh, uh, one of the stories that I've benefited from and, and used is Pete and Jerry Scazzaro in New York. They wrote a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality about burnout and then recovery by entering into the older monastic practices, Christian practices. And then spiritual direction uses a lot of these um, sources. Evangelism, we're returning to a desire for goodness, beauty, love, connection, justice, order, and so on. Desire for a happy ending. You see this in a lot of what I have taught already. Uh, especially here, desire to be more good, beautiful, loving, connected, just, like to become these things, like that we actually want these things. Uh, we're not naive about sin, but fundamentally, we speak to that part of us, right? And then desire for a truly good God, a God who is not complicit with human evil. This gives us interesting possibilities with, with Islam, for example, and many other traditions, because uh, I'll just say quickly, Islam, uh, Sufi Islam in particular, uh, made contact with early Christian thought. And, and so they have this um, language of becoming one with God, and even though many other Muslims look at that branch and say, like, you shouldn't talk that way. That's not how we are supposed to talk as Muslims. But that, that is an interesting um, possibility for conversation. And then politically, I think we do we have an opportunity to talk about virtue ethics, right? It's uh, the formation of character. Why, why is that important? As opposed to simply a public realm that is all about retribution. So if you want more information about this, uh, here's a snapshot of my organization's website. And uh, you could go down and, and find <clears throat> Any of you know tools related to things you're interested in or under topics, uh, there's the topic of desire, which is a big sprawling section, which I keep trying to refine. But if you want Bible studies on some of these passages that have come up, uh, please talk to me or, or check you. And with that, I will stop and um, I'll, I'll have us discuss for a little bit.